Good evening. Welcome to the Bradford County Historical Society. And uh, we continue to be open here at the museum. If you stop by Wednesday through Friday, 10 to 4, uh, we are available. The research library is available upstairs as well. So uh, Jonathan out there is anxious to give you a tour of anything new that's going on around here. Um, our speaker tonight is Mary Ellen Kunst, who is well known as a historian. She's been here before, and this time she's going to be talking about the history of St. Anne's Parish of Bentley Creek, and so we're happy to have her. I'll turn it over to you and lower the microphone. And lower the microphone. Where's the off switch if I start coughing? <laughs> there isn't a switch? Ah. Well, I'm going to sit in my chair so I'm taller. <laughs> I think I need to move over, though. Okay. The book that this is based on is called A Hundred and Years Remembered, and we actually made the book in 1890, 18, 1993, and this is what it looks like. And if you ever see one for sale, grab it, because if you're interested, um, we only printed so many, and then they were gone real quick. So if you are, you know, interested, now the libraries should have them locally. Um, they should have one here, right, Matt? Okay. Huh. All righty. So the 150 years was coming up for the parish, the sesquicentennial, and we got a group together. What are we going to do? What are we going to celebrate for this um, sesquicentennial? Then we realized that it was the centennial for St. Anne's and the centennial for Our Lady, just one year apart. So we started in 93 and we ended in 95 because we had three celebrations going all at once. So it was really nice. So we decided to put the history into a book so that people could have, you know, pictures and, and all this information. So, let's see what we do here. All right, Matt. <laughs> Never mind, I know what I did. <laughs> So they came across the ocean from their homeland in Ireland to this new land, bringing their faith, convictions, and worth ethics to start a new life, building their homes and raising their families in the wilds of Ridgeberry Township. And this is the story of St. Anne's Parish. Now, here's the book. Well, here it is. The real story of any institution is the people, and that's what I kind of based this on. Um, Oh, I just lost my train of thought. So, we're going to move on for now. They were hardy, hard-working, long-lived people. They cleared the land, burned fallows, built for many years their homesteads in the Irish woods. Cornelius O'Driscoll and Richard O'Connor were the first to come with their families in 1840. John Walsh and his family came that same year and settled on Mormon Hill. If you know where that is, um, no? Okay. When you're traveling south on um, Berwick Turnpike, most of Ridgeberry is up on the left, but Mormon Hill is just up on the right. Ridgeberry, before I go any further, Ridgeberry was huge, uh, Ridgeberry Township. It bordered, let me see, it bordered with Sayre, Athens Township, down to Myland, East Smithfield, Springfield Township, um, South Creek Township, around, um, along, I think, New York State border, and then, well, that's town of Ashland, but in a little further, but I mean, this thing was, was a huge township so when we talk about it I can't tell you exactly where everybody lived or it was just a vast but most of the people that when they first came 
were up on the mountain in Ridgebury where the Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church is. So if that helps any of you. Um, there was James White came in 1841 and George O'Leary in 1842 and others were Daniel Desmond and Sons, John and, John and Timothy, Richard Hurley, John Mahoney, Patrick Butler, Daniel, George, and Thomas Chambers, Daniel Kane, and James Crowley. And there's a lot of names here that are still familiar with the area. Um, Daniel Desmond had a name, a road named after himself, although I, last time we were up at the cemetery, that name has changed. So, so Charles Carroll, signer of the Declaration of Independence, he gets all the credit, but it, it's really his granddaughter, Louisa Catherine Caton, who should get the credit. Um, Charles Carroll owned like 10,000 acres of land. And the way it worked back then is when you were given land to settle, you had to settle it. Somebody had to actually build on it and settle it or they lost the land. And he didn't want to do that because this was a lot of money for him. So the Duchess of Leeds, who's Louisa, was touched by the plight of the starving Irish people during the potato famine. She paid passage for a number of Irish families and helped them to buy land from her grandfather's track in Pennsylvania, the area now known as Ridgebury Township. So she brought these people over, paid for their passage, and they started working the land in Ridgebury. And it's, um, if anybody's familiar with Ridgebury, it's all rocks. I don't know how they grew anything up there. Um, but they had to work for money. So what they would do is they would go down and they would work the canals during the day, 10, 12 hour days, and then they'd, it would take them maybe six miles to get to work and then they'd come back up at the end of the day and they would do work on the farm and then they'd do it again the next day. So it was very hard, very hard for them, but they did it. That's the amazing thing. Back then you didn't have a choice, you either did it or, so when the Irish came to Ridgebury, the area was literally one great forest. They cleared paths, cut the brush, and burned the fallow along the way. As the forests were felled, vistas of great beauty opened up to the settlers. They built log homes and raised crops and livestock. The land was productive and grew superior potatoes and hay. They grew fat cattle for which there were always buyers and raised sheep for food and wool to make yarn. Now, the potatoes, you'd have to have good soil to grow potatoes. But if you ever notice driving around those hills, you'll see a lot of old stone walls. That's because there were so many stones taken out of the fields that they were able to, to build stone walls with them. Church service started as prayer groups in the homes as there was no church built yet. The first mass in Ridgebury was said by Father John Vincent O'Reilly at the home of Daniel Kane in March of 1843. He rode from Tawanda for the event, and yes, he rode horseback. Um, that was their mode of travel. There really were no roads per se yet. O'Leary, the O'Leary family donated land on the corner of Chapel and Desmond Roads where a log church was built in 1843. So this was the start of the first church um, in 1843 up in Ridgebury. And if you're familiar with where the cemetery is up there today, that's the corner of where this log cabin was built. Now, Reverend John Vincent O'Reilly was considered a circuit rider or a saddlebag preacher. They'd put their Bible in the saddlebag and off they'd go. Now, he was sent in 1838 by Bishop Kenrick to assist in ministering to the Catholics of this extensive territory. He took up his residence at St. Joseph's in Pennsylvania and his charge comprised the counties of Susquehanna, Bradford, Tioga, Potter, and Sullivan in Pennsylvania, and the five adjoining counties in New York State on horseback. <laughs> wow. 
As time went on, he used trains when there were trains available. The early history of the diocese is intimately bound up with the truly heroic labors of Father O'Reilly and foundations of many of the present parishioners were the results of his missionary zeal. Sadly, his fruitful career was brought to an untimely end at the rail station at Susquehanna, October 4th, 1873. He was killed while rescuing a friend from the path of an approaching train. That's a sad ending. Now this is, I jumped ahead a little bit. This is Mrs. Ellen Herlihan, and she was honored at a mass in, at, in 1930, she was the only living member of a class of eight baptized in 1843. And so she had to be, well, she was born in 1842, and I don't know when, what month. Her father, Michael Grace, rode to Silver Lake, Susquehanna County, for a priest and returned with Father O'Reilly Michael on foot and Father O'Reilly on horseback. In 1930, a dinner was served on the lawn of the church. 300 attended to commemorate where the first mass and baptisms were celebrated. So you're seeing the celebration. And honestly, I don't know where that was um, because of the hill behind. Um, I'm not positive. This is Bishop John Newman of the Philadelphia Diocese. He was a young, energetic immigrant born March 28, 1811 in Bohemia. He visited the churches and missions of his diocese. He was a master of seven languages and he learned Gaelic to better minister to his Irish parishioners. He became proficient enough in Gaelic that one Irish lady was heard to exclaim, thanks be to God, at last we have an Irish bishop. <laughs> he blessed the fields that had been cleared and consecrated the ground for a cemetery. Many parishioners believe the visits of this holy man to our area to say mass for his people, to bless their cemetery and fields is a major historical event for the area. Bishop Newman was canonized June 19, 1977 at Vatican City by Pope Paul VI. So that was pretty special to have him up in Ridgebury. <laughs> now this is a contract for the first church, and I should say the first frame church because we already had a log church up there. And at the time, it wasn't called Our Ladies or St. Anne's, it was called St. Mary's. And this was built in 1852 by Ansel Scott of East Smithfield. Um, it cost $750 and was located where the log church sat in the northeast corner of the cemetery. Now, one thing I'm going to mention is the, the cemetery where this church sat and where the log cabin sat before that, they used to bury parishioners around the old church. So when they, that church was removed, there's like a space in there where nobody's buried. And so now I guess they're starting to try to fill that up. But you could actually go into the cemetery and see exactly where that church sat. So this, um, is just a, a piece of, um, you know, the information on the church as it was being built. And if you look at this picture of the, right here, this window, um, remember that, because I'm going to show you another picture pretty soon where you'll see that. Now, for some reason, they wanted to have the chapel painted white. But for some reason, they decided later that instead they would paint it what is called Ohio Fine Proof Paint, a brown color. Now, I don't know if it was because of cost or what the reason was, but that's what they painted it. Now, if you look at this building up here, there's the windows. And this was St. Mary's Church, but it had been enlarged right here. 
this part was added on after it was moved past the cemetery as we know it today. And that stayed there until Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church was built, and at which time it turned into what they called the Lyceum. And boy, there was one, there were a lot of parties there, fiddling going on and the whole nine yards. They, the old parishioners used to tell us about it, and it sounded like it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so um, they refitted it in 1877 and moved it at that time. And um, there was also a shelter in that area for the horse and buggies that came in for the masses um, in bad weather, but we never could find a picture of that. Now the bottom picture, that's about the time they were ready to tear that down. The Lyceum was torn down, I think, in the 50s. And um, actually, I know of a house in Ridgebury that they used this wood to, to build the house. And I wouldn't doubt there's probably a few more, because that's a lot of wood. <laughs> so this is St. Anne's Roman Catholic Church. And this is down in, on Bentley Creek um, on the Berwick Turnpike Road. It was built in 1894. There were a lot of families um, down in Bentley Creek, and they didn't like traveling all the way up to Our Lady of Perpetual Help, especially in the winter. Uh, this was built by Milton Cooper. I don't know where Milton was from. This is a picture of the original altar, and you can see where they still had the, um, oops, sorry, that was me. They had the railing around right here that they always took out and the, the little doors. So that's the original. And then this is just a picture of St. Anne's. It was always difficult to get because the sun would shine on it so bright. So you either had shadows or too much sun. Now it's closed. I don't know who owns it now. This is an icon of St. Anne and a statue inside. And you can see the windows here are different than the ones up at uh, St. Mary's. These are additional pictures. Now this altar, this is a later picture of the of the altar. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> Clickers and remotes, they're not my friend. <laughs> um, okay, this is Our Lady of Perpetual Help up, in, up on the hill. We call it the hill, it's on top of the mountain, but um, this was built by Frank Case of Troy in 1895. And this is across the road from where the first church and where the cemetery is today. And I think this picture was taken right after they had done a beautiful paint job inside. It's a, it's a larger church than down at uh, St. Anne's. And then this other picture is definitely um, early. This is an icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. A few more pictures. This one is at Christmas time with the manger. And uh, the nave in the choir loft is in the back. And up on top is one of the uh, medallions in the stained glass, and we'll talk about that in a minute. There's so many pictures taken of um, out in the cemetery looking at the, the chapel. We always call it Ridgebury Chapel. Um, it was very, very folk, you know, um, it just took, I don't know, there's so many nice pictures of it, usually in the fall. Um, and then this one is a picture of the stained glass window, and this is so different than the one down at St. Anne's. We'll go into that stuff too. These are a few of the priests that served in the parish. 
There's um, Father Birchall, uh, Conmi, Maloney, Martin, Shalala, Irwin, Mulrooney, Sammons, and Hughes. Now, going back to the Irish here, the green horns are coming. This was a nice story that Mary Farr had written about 1866, three Irish sisters, Anna, Abby, and Mary, left Ogadown, Skibbereen County, Cork, Ireland, for the U.S. They were warmly welcomed and cared for by their mother's sister, sister Nora Woolley Hurley, and her husband, Tim, who ran a pub on Bloomer Ave in Elmira, which is now Mustacos. I don't know if Mustacos is still around or not. They met Irish lads from Ridgebury, Will Farr, Mike Reagan, and Pat Murphy. Anna married Will, Mary married Mike, and Abby married Pat. Soon the sisters made arrangements for their mother, father, and nine sisters and brothers to come join them. The sons-in-law drove two large flat-bottomed wagons to the Willowana Railroad Station to transport them in their trunks to the farm of Anna and Will Farr. And here they are. Can you imagine? <laughs> so the top left is Hannah, Larry, Abby Murphy, William Sullivan, Michael Sullivan, Nora Leary, Mary Reagan. Seated is Elizabeth Caverly, Timothy Sullivan, and the mother, Ab Abby Woolley Sullivan, and the father, John Sullivan, and Anna Farr, Patrick Sullivan, and on the floor is Ellen Caverly. And so it begins. All these Irish families up there, they start marrying into each other's families. And I got to tell you, it was confusing. <laughs> I think Timothy, let's see, he'd be the second one. Oh, I'm not sure which one now. One of them, right, but I don't know if it was him or I wanted to say William. One of them, there is no William. Up in the back, yeah, you're right. It might have been, oh shoot. <laughs> Go back. It might have been him. Died in Ralston, um, hit by a train. Ralston was real busy with coal mining and, and iron ore and uh, a lot of trains going back and forth. And I think it was William that, that died, sadly to come all this way, you know. So this was interesting. Father Ron uh, had a couple of, I don't know if they were Cub Scouts or what they were helping him. Maybe they were older boys. And uh, cleaning up the churches for the celebrations. And they decided to go down in the basement and clean out, you know, whatever was down there. And at St. Anne's, they found the top of this baptismal buried in the dirt floor. Now the swivel top had broken on this baptism so that somebody carried it downstairs and left it. It's made out of a white steel. Um, and it was used from 1894 until like 1920 or 30s. So for the um, celebration they restored it and it took it back upstairs, and it was blessed on the feast of the baptism of the Lord for the 150th celebration. Now, here's the windows at St. Anne's again, and these were made of a Gothic-style stained glass window restored in the 1970s. From medieval times, stained glass windows were used to tell stories of the Bible for those who did not have the ability to read. They also served as adornment in the church, and those with inscriptions meant someone paid to have their name or a loved one's name on the window as a memorial. And so the inscriptions are John Chambers, Daniel Sullivan, Mortimer Mackesy, Mrs. Florence O'Leary, Frank McCormick, Michael Kane, 
the Right Reverend W. O. Hara, Bishop of Scranton, John Welsh Jr., James Kane, Mrs. Elizabeth Buck, Mrs. Patrick Carroll, Cornelius Donahue, and William Neville. We had some help with the windows, describing the windows for us and giving us information at the time. And that was Robert Yeager. He was Vice President of Program Development at the Philadelphia Historic Preservation. And the stained glass windows at Our Lady of Perpetual Help are of a Romanesque design. You can see the difference. Um, they are rich with Gothic and Renaissance Revival ornament. The windows include a wide spectrum of stained glass popular in the 1890s. The painted center medallions provide important symbols which aid the worship and are of special importance. The memorial inscri inscriptions provide the only visible reminders to the parishioners who gave so much of themselves in the life of the parish almost a century ago. And the inscriptions were Jeremiah and Margaret Collins, Thomas and Catherine Chambers, Anthony and Elizabeth Allen, Daniel and Mary Sullivan, Dennis and Jane O'Leary, George and Margaret Chambers, Henry and Catherine Farr, I don't know what I did there, <laughs> Richard Hurley, John and Ann Limerick, Timothy and Mary O'Connell, and John and Honora Collins. And you can see the medallions that they were talking about right here. And each window had a different medallion. Um, and then this is that picture again. It's um, an early picture, but I, it's not when the church was built because the grass is growing up nice around it. So might have been early 1900s. So the medallion descriptions, I had a lot of pictures of the church windows, and do you think I could find them? We moved a year ago, and I don't know where they would be. So what we did is I took two of them that I had pictures of, and for an example, the first one with the sheep would be Lamb of God, is in the image that we have from the Apocalypse of St. John, and the crossed keys in the cross for the papal power based on St. Peter. And uh, Virginia Ragwin, uh, Director of Census of Stained Glass Windows in America, Department of Visual Arts, College of Holy Cross, gave us all the descriptions, and uh, these people were so willing to help us. Now, the windows at Our Lady Perpetual Help had not been uh, restored, and they were in bad shape. Just like a, a brick building, every hundred years that brick has to be repointed. And by that they mean putting new mortar in and making sure the bricks are up where they're supposed to be. Well, with a stained glass window it's the same way. Usually they say a hundred years. And stained glass is heavy. The glass is heavy, but the lead is, um, what do you want to call it? It's it just, you know, it can sag after a while. So all the glass starts to sag. Um, they try to, to um, push the windows back up with metal rods, but after a while it just doesn't work. And once the glass starts coming down, it starts breaking. And then from there, they're trying to repair the glass with what they had, and it, it was time. But it was going to cost us $30,000. So we started having um, donations come in, and people were, were really great about it. We made our $30,000. We had a company called Lamb Studios from Philadelphia, and they came in one day, October 5th, 1992, and we had bought um, storm windows to put on the outside because there'd be nothing the church would be open so they put the storm windows up and this group came in and they started taking the windows down and what a feeling that leaves you with because they're taking all of them it's like you know um 
how the Grinch stole Christmas. He took everything while the windows were going. So um, they relutted, they repaired and cleaned the glass, um, and they returned him on December 1st. But the day that they left in a little white van, all our windows were in that van, and you wonder, are we ever going to see them again? So we had a celebration mass, October 17, 1993, the following year, honoring those who contributed to the window restoration fund in memory of those who have gone before us and whose names are inscribed on the windows. Folks attending the mass traveled from Vermont, Nebraska, Ohio, New York State, and counties Cork and Limerick in Ireland, Donor names and memorials appeared on plaques placed behind the windows and on a wall plaque in the vestibule. And when they came back, they looked beautiful. This picture, I think, was taken at the same time as the other old one. Um, I have a feeling this was a um, Memorial Day service or a Decoration Day, they called it. because this is a Decoration Day service, uh, 1912. And the thing that most people don't realize today is we call the cemetery Our Lady of Perpetual Help, but it was named originally St. Mary's, and that's never changed. So as far as I know, it's actually still St. Mary's legally. So. Um, that was Memorial Day in 1912, and this one was Memor Memorial Day Mass in 1988 and 1989. Drastic change in the, in the clothing. <laughs> Another picture of the cemetery in the fall. And this is a photo gallery of the families who built the parish. This was J.C. Buck, blacksmithing, carriage, and ironing. No idea where this was. I'm thinking it might have been off the Berwick Turnpike down closer to Bentley Creek. Now, I apologize for this picture because it's really bad shape. And I tried my darndest to Photoshop that and get it looking good. Um, but there's an important thing about this picture and is that they had an orphan boy, or a homeboy they called him, and they had him right in there with the family. And I thought that was really nice. This is Cornelius and Mary Crowley Kane. I saw Cain spelled both ways, so I'm not sure. I would say it's probably C-A-I-N. And children, Daniel, Ellen, James, Dennis, Cornelius Jr., John, Timothy, David. It's either Johanna, I guess, and Patrick, and the homeboy. Now, I don't know his name, but it was awfully nice that they, they did take a picture with him. Mr. and Mrs. Andrew Buston, and John and Ellen Limerick Kane, and children John, Thomas, Daniel, and Mary. This is John Kane of Ridgebury and Ellen Coveney, or Cuffney, of Pond Hill, Lake Wasocking, and William and Julia Coveney wedding party. There were a lot of Irish over on Pond Hill, and so when they had weddings or whatnot, they all got together. So this was um, the wedding of um, John and Ellen, and if you look, you can see them up here. And then the two that were the wedding party are here. But as far as the others, I don't know.
This is the Caverly family, and they were out playing baseball. I, I think the whole purpose of that picture was for that beautiful barn that they built. Leo Caverly, and then Edward and Bob Clark and Bill O'Brien, and then Ed Clark, who owned a creamery in Ridgeberry at the top of Mile Lane Road. Now, Ed Clark was the original owner of Ted Clark's in Waverly, the market. And so his business actually started at the top of Mile Lane um, in Ridgeberry. He had a, a creamery there. And so that's a younger version of him. And then his brother, and then this was Bill O'Brien from O'Brien's Inn in Waverly. Um, we lived for a while, my folks lived up in Ridgeberry on Myers Road, and there was this little house that we would drive by every day, and we were told that that's where the Clarks lived. And then we were told that's where the O'Briens lived. And uh, so both of these families evidently came out of the same house at different times, different generations probably. But they were Ridgeberry boys. The Coakley homestead on Chapel Road is still there. Um, a couple came in, golly, quite a while ago now, and they, they modernized it a lot. But if you look close, I can't think of the road that runs next to it. It's in an intersection, but um, that house is still standing. The Collins homestead with family, and notice they say, and an orphan boy. And I don't know who the orphan boy is. It would either, darn it, I did it again. <laughs> Need to mark these. It's either this gentleman here or probably this one here. But we're going to get into that in a little bit about the orphan boys. This is Daniel Collins and Mary Ellen Caverly, married at Our Lady of Perpetual Help, June 28, 1906. And the next one is Dan Collins and Judd. So I'm assuming Judd Collins with Mildred Cork and Carl. You know, it's wonderful to have these old pictures to see who they were, um, see who the different families were at the time. You have Francis Collins. Now, Joseph Collins is not related to Francis, I don't believe, because Joseph was an orphan from Brooklyn raised by the O'Connell family. So they kept their names um, that they were born with in most cases. And um, it's possible that their parents didn't die but just couldn't take care of them. Or maybe one parent died and the other one had to work. There's a lot of different circumstances behind these orphanages. Um, this is Tom Collin and John Horrigan. All these pictures were in this book that we, we did. This is the Coveney family, Elizabeth O'Leary Coveney. Dennis and Elizabeth Farr Coveney, and Elizabeth Coveney and Ellen Nell Coveney Crotty. More Coveneys. John Coveney and wife Margaret Maloney sitting, standing as Eugene Coveney and Ellen Nell Maloney. Donovans, Elizabeth Donovan and Mr. and Mrs. Patrick Donovan, and I don't know if Elizabeth is Mrs. Patrick Donovan or not. Margaret and William Donovan, sister and brother, and some of the children were Bobby and Mary Elizabeth Donovan and Mary and Bill Donovan. I know I just saw an obituary for Bill week or two ago. This is the Driscoll Gatings Homestead, and I love this picture. Um, there's Nellie Driscoll. Peter Gatings was an orphan 
who, when he grew to adulthood, stayed in Ridgebury, and Mary Catherine Driscoll Gatings. And I think those two were married. Um, on this one, if you look close, you'll see a lady standing there holding a dog. And you've got another person here. But I just love the porch on that house. And that house is still on, standing on Ridgebury Road. Just doesn't have the porch anymore. Catherine Doran or Doolin Farr and Henry Farr. There were a lot of Farrs. <laughs> Henry Farr family, Mary Ann and Henry, left to right, Anna Tomic Farr, Daniel Farr, Kathleen McCallum Farr, John Farr, Margaret Farr, Martha Lynch Farr, and sitting was Henry and Frank Farr. Nice family picture. Joe Farr and Katie Klein wedding. And I'm not sure where this was taken, this house. I'm wondering if it could have even been in Waverly. More of the Farrs. We have Joseph, John, and Henry in the back row. Abby, Farr, O'Brien. Leo Farr, Catherine Farr, Johnson, Cronin, and Anna Sullivan Farr, and William Farr. Now, the Catherine Farr, Johnson, Cronin in the first picture is in the second picture marrying Bart Johnson. So something happened where she ended up remarrying, which I'm sure happened a lot back then. And this is Anna Sullivan Farr again, Teresa Baker, and Ellen Sullivan Caverly. Now, Abby Farr is Ed O'Brien's mother from O'Brien's Inn, and Martha Farr. This is the Farr family home on Farr Road. <laughs> and I think Alan Dolores Farr was the last family to live there. This is from the back. So you had John Farr and John Caverly, and Henry and Anna Farr with son William. Is anybody here related to any of these people? No? OK. Now, down at St. Anne's, they had a, um, they had a hall that they built. And as you can see, this was early on. This um, looked more like a barn than a, than a hall. Um, later years, it had um, insulation and walls put in, and, and uh, it was a nice hall for quite a, quite a few years. Um, this is a celebration at Thanksgiving time for Farley Collins families, 50th anniversary celebration at St. Anne's. Um, I don't know if it was the 90s, can't quite remember, but the building was starting to, to fade and the, the walls were starting to implode a little bit. And they decided it was time to tear it down and build a new one. So they did build a beautiful new hall and uh, now I think it's, because they closed down there, I think it's a, a nursery, daycare, something like that. What is it now? Oh, do they? It's a mushroom. What? Kidding me. That was a beautiful building. Oh, no kidding. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Now this is William Farr. We used to go for walks out in the, you know, in the fall up in the hills and there was one particular spot we used to like to go and there was this old foundation and apple orchards. We always got approval to go, but um, it was on a far property. And this is, um, has to do with a story. But this was uh, William Farr and he was in the First World War. Uh, he was a private in Company K, 
8th Infantry of the Regular Army. He was killed in action March 1st of 1918. And this article in the paper was telling about him coming, his body coming home. And if you notice, the date was June 17, 1921. So, of course, it was several years later. And um, very sad, but the story I remember hearing, and I, and I found this, um, when this niece of his, Mary Lynch Ramick, when I was a small child, I spent a lot of time at Grandpa and Grandma Farr's home in Ridgebury. Their farm was the first one below Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church. I never met Uncle Will, the oldest son, because he had gone to France to fight in the First World War. I remember that a large portrait of him hung at the top of the landing when you went up to the second floor. Mother told me that one night Grandma woke up screaming and said she had dreamt that Will was dead. Just then his picture in the hall fell and broke. A short time later, the family received official word of Will's death, and they were all sure that he had died at the time Grandma had the dream. And that's a true story. So sadly enough, he was quite young when he was killed. More pictures. Kate Galvin and her friend. I don't know who is who or who the friend is, and Kate Higgins was Pat Donovan's friend. All we had to go by was what was on the back of the pictures. <laughs> this is Mary Chambers Grace and um, son Joseph, circa 1914, and Gertrude James and Helen Grace. But there's one more boy, and I don't know why that wasn't identified. Maybe an orphan. So these were weddings, the Larry weddings, Daniel Larry wedding, Mr. and Mrs. Bill Murphy, and Daniel and Margaret Sullivan Larry, and John and Nora Sullivan Larry wedding is the second picture. You know, in those pictures, it's hard to tell who got married and who's standing up for them. <laughs> So these are the orphan boys of Ridgebury. They were homeboys, they called them. And the gentleman with the bicycle was Frank Miller. And the one in the middle is, we don't have a name. And then there was Gus Miller and John Greenan. And the orphans arrived between 1890 and 1926. They referred to as homeboys. They relocated to the Ridgebury area from numerous orphanages in Pennsylvania and New York, including St. Michael's of Scranton, St. Michael's of Brooklyn, Orphanage of West Point off the Hudson, Father Baker's home of Buffalo. Travel arrangements varied. If the family had a car in time to pick up the orphan, they would also pick up other orphans for families in the area. Lehigh Valley train transported orphans to the Sear Station the majority of sponsors were bachelors and maiden ladies in need of assistance to perform farm work. The boys might stray from their sponsored homes to other families or individuals who were interested in them or maybe who treated them a little nicer. We don't know. <laughs> Many of the boys stayed in contact with their biological families. Now, I don't know if this plays into it, but I, I did a little research on this woman, Anna Laura Hill. She was a placing agent known as the Orphan Train Lady from 1903 to 1932. She made 160 rail trips with groups of orphans. There were sometimes 50 or more children aged 5 to 17 occupying a single rail car, wearing new clothing and given a Bible to read. Born in Burlington, Pennsylvania, she grew up in Elmira, attended Mansfield Normal School, resided in Kansas for a while because that's, they were mostly going from New York to Kansas, New York to all these different western states. It has been estimated by the National Orphan Train Museum that more than 250,000 children found new homes during the 75 years of what is now remembered as the orphan train movement 
Before it ended, children were placed in 45 states, as well as Canada and Mexico. After retirement, she resided at 1525 West Water Street in Elmira. Um, I don't know if she had anything to do with the orphans that came to Ridgeberry, but they had agents who would place the children. They never talk about money, so I don't know if anybody paid anything, but there are several books on the orphan trains, and there's a movie. So if you're interested, you might want to check something like that out. We did have people who would come to the church in later years and, and introduce himself and say, I was, I was an orphan. I was one of the orphan boys. And he says, and you see those, those stone walls right there? I built those, he says. So they, they put the kids to work, but in return they had fresh air, good, good food. They always say there's always an extra place at a farmer's table. You know, they gave them a place to live, and, and they helped them in probably more ways than you can imagine. But yes, they did have to do work. So that was very interesting. And some stayed on, and some became part of the family so, so much that they had the, the farm's will to them eventually. So, I mean, you know, they, it was a, a nice program. And they did this all over the country. And they would go back, and they would check on them several times a year, if you can imagine that, make sure they were doing all right, and they would take pictures of them. So um, those pictures could possibly be ones that an agent took. So back to the <laughs> parishioners. We have John Lone. It's probably a shillelagh, an original there he's got. And uh, Andrew, Edward Andrew Maloney, Ellen Coveney Crotty, and Margaret Mary Maloney. We have Mary Robinson Reardon and Michael and Mary Sullivan Reagan. We have Patrick Henry McCarthy, 1890 to 1959, from County Rose Common. Richard and Mary Jane Farr Reagan, we knew them well. They were a wonderful couple. Catherine Murphy Sullivan, wife of Patrick. And next is a picture of their wedding. Um, Patrick, son of John and Abigail Woolley Sullivan, with wife Catherine Murphy Sullivan and Anna Murphy Collins, and the gentleman, we don't know who he is. The first, set of, the first picture here is of William Sullivan's children, Helen, John, and William, and I love the pictures of the children. Um, the second one is Pat, Patrick and Catherine Murphy Sullivan, and they have Abigail, Patrick, Josephine, John, and Catherine, and Anna. So the children were um, Abigail, Josephine, John, and Anna. And then we had First Holy Communion. And this is Teresa Ann Walsh at the farm. And then this looks like it was probably in the church uh, somewhere in the 1950s. There were no names associated with this picture. When the lilacs came out for Mother's Day, that's when they had the first communion. These are school marms, and I don't have their names uh, except for one. The third from the right is Martha Farr. And these school marms, every month they would go live at a different home of one of the children in the school. Um, and there they would be given a room and, and meals. Um, they didn't make much money, but uh, they had quite a job. And look how young these girls are. And this group, I don't know where they were. Somebody's barn. There's a horse in the back. And somebody's got a, a jug up there that looks like they're having a, 
little something to drink and having a good time. <laughs> and moving on, we have Julia and Timothy Desmond. Okay, Julia Desmond and Timothy Sullivan. And this is their family in later years, uh, around 1920. So starting back here is standing because he's sitting. So you had Robert, Desmond, Mary, and Philip, and this was John, Julia, Richland, Mark, Timothy, and Margaret. So that family grew, didn't it? <laughs> well, it's not moving. This is the Walsh family, Charles Walsh and Edna Slater. And the girls were Inez Walsh Fox, Eugenia Walsh Canavino, and Mary Walsh Kenner. That's an adorable picture. And last but not least, we have Margaret Horrigan White. And I think if, this has to be my favorite picture. <laughs> And October 4th, 1993, the Clement Heverly Outstanding Service Award was presented by the Bradford County Historical Society to the History Committee of St. Anne's Roman Catholic Parish, Bentley Creek, Pennsylvania, in recognition of their unstinting efforts in compiling a history in conjunction with the observance of the 150th anniversary of the parish. And we are very proud to accept that. <laughs> So thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, any questions or comments? Yes. The Lyceum was originally St. Mary's Church, and it was added on because they had, you know, the parishioner number was growing. But uh, eventually, when Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church was built across the road, they turned it into um, a hall for parties, probably wedding receptions. They said every Friday night, I, no, not Friday night, when was it? They would have big, big parties. And I know um, one of the Leahy boys would take his fiddle, and, and they'd go up there, and they'd have a grand time. <laughs> It's called Our Lady of Perpetual Help, but the actual name of that cemetery is St. Mary's Cemetery. So it, it, it's the church is associated with that cemetery. The one down below is St. Anne's. No, that's St. Anne's. That's down in Bentley Creek along Berwick Turnpike. So the Lyceum was up on top of the mountain. Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Well, come on up when we're done, and and I can show you. Yes. No, I have a drawing of him. Yeah. That I don't know. Yes. Okay. So I would say he's associated with Tennessee Education. Okay. I don't know about other Really? He might want to check online and see what you can find. I had a really hard time finding some pictures of, of the priests and Father O'Reilly. I'm lucky to have this one, and I did a lot of Photoshopping to get it to where it is, but yeah. Anything else? Yes. The original parish was Our Lady Perpetual Help. Mm, the original was it was called um, Saint Mary's. Right, the, the one up on the hill. On the hill, yes. And then they built Saint Anne's. Yes. As an auxiliary, as a, a mis addition to that. 
Right. And then somehow the parish became St. Anne's instead of, you know what I mean? They, they changed, the parish was originally St. Mary's Church. Right, and then they built St. Anne's and somehow the parish became St. Anne's. Epiphany. Epiphany. Mm -hmm. there. Correct. So how did that happen? They they closed a lot of churches. They closed St. Anne's. They closed. Um, is it St. Joseph's? St. John's. You know the one in Athens, the one in South Waverly. But they kept Our Lady of Perpetual Health. I. Because it is a beautiful church, um, and and the funny thing, it's it's a beautiful church, but um, I think they go by collections, and because there's some um, wealthy individuals who live nearby around the lakes, I think they they keep it open. But um, yeah, I, I you know. Everybody keeps their fingers crossed because you'd hate to see it closed. And the, there's, there's not much maintenance to that church. We've had the windows replaced. It had siding put on it. That church could actually be put on the um, historic preservation on the inside because of the integrity is still there. But on the outside, it's gone because they, they sided it. But there's not even a bathroom in that church. There's... The only running water was for a boiler at one time. I mean, it's, you know, they just have an outhouse out back. They never upgraded it. So I guess they'll keep it as long as it doesn't cost them money, probably. <laughs> and they have a priest. Sadly, right, correct, absolutely. But the church, or the cemetery itself, somebody asked about the cemetery. The cemetery was started for that church up there. And there's an, a cemetery association. And there was quite a battle going for a while, but that cemetery association is freestanding and it does not belong to the diocese. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, yes. Okay, yeah. And like, I don't know. And like Father Ron Hughes, he came down here after being at St. Anne's Parish. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. very much. I told you she was an expert. So. Uh, next month's program we have Van Wagner coming. He's, all, he's always very good. Uh, does music of all kinds, plays the guitar, I think he plays the banjo, he plays some unusual instruments you've never seen and does a lot of singing as well. So come back for that next month and thank you for coming.